Hi everyone, I'm Tim Robertson and I work for GBIF, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. I wish we were together in person, but I'm calling you from Copenhagen in Denmark today. I'd like to say thank you for inviting me to your workshop and express that it's been a real pleasure for us at GBIF to collaborate with you in recent years. Many of you won't know what GBIF is, so what I'd like to do today is just give you an introduction to the organization and what we do, talk a little bit about the open data network we have, how we integrate data, give you a bit of insight into data services that we offer, and talk about two aspects which are important to a healthy open data community, and that's licensing and citation. So GBIF is a multi-government organization, and we exist to make biodiversity data freely and openly available on the internet. So we build open data infrastructure. We focus on evidence of where species have been recorded, and we've integrated around about 1.8 billion records, um, of which there's around about 83 million with images. We also track how these data are being used in research, and we're approaching four peer-reviewed papers per day that are citing data that has been mediated through GBIF. These citations are growing, and we're seeing around about 30% increase year on year on data citations, and our data is growing at approximately 1 million records per day. Everything we do at GBIF is open. We're about open data and open source development. So everything I'm presenting today, you can find on our website or is available through one of our APIs on the URLs shown. So first and foremost, as an open data network, we're an international community. So this map gives you an idea of where the institutions who publish data on GBIF are located. Now we strive to be truly global and we are expanding and we invite anybody um, who is aware of projects that can help complete this picture to get in touch with us. And this map is showing where we have data. So behind each of the pixels that is lit up, there is evidence of species being recorded at that point. The map also gives you some insights into the geographic biases that we have in the integrated data set today. So what kind of data do people share within GBIF? Well, GBIF originated from the uh, museum community, where there's around about 200 million records today um, documenting uh, specimens that are preserved in these institutions, pinned insects and dried plants and, and such like. Each of these records comes with a series of metadata describing what species it is, who's identified it, where it was found, when it was found, how it's been preserved, what kind of evidence is there um, to support the claim that the species existed at that point. These data can also carry things like sequences, measurements, and many of them are imaged. There are many highly active citizen science groups connected to GBIF, such as the Art Portalen group from Sweden, shown here. And these are communities of people where anybody can record um, observations of um, nature. And then there's discussion processes and community vetting of the content before it reaches the GBIF systems. There's several projects dealing with literature connected to GBIF. And that includes both historical literature, where old books are being scanned, um, digitized, OCR processes extracting text, and then structure is being extracted from that text. And then there's newer processes where newly described species published in a journal are in some cases made available in GBIF within hours of being published. Animal tracking data sets are another kind that you'll find within GBIF as it's becoming increasingly cost-effective to deploy a tracking device on an individual and then monitor it over a period of time. We also deal with DNA-derived data. Um, so the example shown here is the Global Malaise program, where around the world people are deploying these tents where insects fly in, they get trapped, um, they die, and periodically people 
take these dead insects, blend them into an insect soup and sequence it to find out what um, was um, recorded within the tent during that period. Now, there's pictures of birds in there. Of course, people are not blending birds, but the birds are going in and eating the insects and leaving droppings. And it's the droppings the, um, from the birds which is being sequenced and giving evidence that there was a bird at that location. We're seeing a growth in automated approaches for monitoring species. So the example shown here is a, an automated camera trap, which I'm looking to deploy in my own garden. And every night during the dark hours, uh, the device will switch on. We'll record pictures of the moths that visit the light trap. And in the morning, um, the images will be processed using AI techniques and try and identify which species have been recorded during the night. Now, I do not know the details of how that AI process is going to run. I just want to use this process to help build a data set of what's been recorded. I'll then push this data into a citizen science network so that a community vetting process can go on before the data appears on GBIF. So now I've given an introduction for the kinds of data that arrive in GBIF, I'd like to talk about how we integrate it. GBIF deploy, what um, many of you may recognize as a typical data warehouse or data lake infrastructure. On the left, we have all of the source systems which are connecting to GBIF and producing data. And there's a whole different variety of systems for how people capture this kind of information. What binds them together in GBIF is the registry. Each of these data sets are registered in GBIF. And this is done through an open API, and you can connect your own systems to GBIF through this API. When there's a change in the registry, um, the crawling infrastructure kicks in and picks up the changes from the data set and brings it into our data warehouse. At this point, we apply a series of um, transformations on the data. We deal with a lot of different data formats and versions, and we organize that into a consistent manner. We deal with data that is often incomplete, and we try and complete the missing parts as data goes through the pipeline. We enrich data, bringing in information about ge uh, geographic context, for example, and we also organize it consistently to a backbone taxonomy. All of these steps in the pipeline make use of external reference catalogs, and these are exposed through APIs. As data comes out of this pipeline, we organize it in various um, technologies for search and reporting and SQL services, and we also deploy an image cache. And this image cache is able to provide uh, thumbnailing and resizing services consistently for all images that are shared through GBIF. And all of this is available on the GBIF website in the end, and also through our open APIs. I'm sure many of you have faced the challenge of integrating data sets where you see the same concepts expressed differently in different data sets. And what you're trying to do is map them onto a common set of features. The way we go about this in GBIF is through our vocabulary server, where we can hold vocabularies for things like life stage, the stage of development that a species is in um, when it's recorded. This is an open server and we're trying to mature our processes and involve the community in the definition of the vocabulary, but also the synonymy that goes on. So what this means is if someone publishes their data in GBIF and they don't like how we've treated their data, we actually have a process by which they can get involved and help influence the vocabularies and how we map data onto those concepts and improve it for everybody. One of our most commonly used APIs is the API for taxonomic organization. So at GBIF, we build a backbone taxonomy of scientific names. And this service allows anybody to look up how a scientific name would appear in the GBIF backbone. So the data that flows through the GBIF systems, they all carry some kind of identification, and that can have spelling mistakes, um, it can be incomplete, 
And this service allows us to provide a consistent view on every record. So the example shown here doesn't tell us what family the, the bird is in, but by using this service, we're able to complete the blanks and then know that this is a species within the Peseridae family. This is an open API and you can integrate it into your own processes today if you're dealing with scientific names. We also see data coming to us from many different databases, which is actually related. And one of our current um, pieces of work is to try and link these records. So on the left, this is a page from our website, which is showing three records. One's coming from a museum, one is coming from a journal, so literature, and one is coming from the Barcode of Life database, which is a database of sequences. In actual fact, all three relate to the same specimen. It's a specimen that's been sequenced and it's been cited in literature. What we are trying to do is deploy machine learning algorithms to link all of this and reproduce the reality of what happened. A species was observed, a specimen was collected. It may be preserved in multiple um, institutions if the specimen has physically been split. One institution may image it, another may sequence it, and another may write a paper about their specimen. What we're trying to do is link all of this together to more accurately give a picture of what's happened, to remove duplicates, and to help transfer information across institutions, which can save them effort and money. So now that you understand a little bit about the kind of data, and how we process it, how do you go about accessing this data? Well, first and foremost, we've got the website where you can go in, you can create custom queries using the controlled vocabulary terms um, that I described. You can browse data, you can download data straight from the website, and all of that's available through the API as well. Recently, we've started putting monthly exports of GBIF onto two major cloud providers. So you'll find monthly views of GBIF available on the Amazon public data catalog, and you'll also find it in the Microsoft planetary computer, the Microsoft Azure cloud. We're looking to get this data onto Google shortly. So I'd like to offer some observations on two important aspects that at GBIF, we have seen are necessary to have a healthy open data community. And those are licensing and citation. So the chart shown here um, gives a, an indication of data growth in GBIF since we started indexing data in 2008. And there's an interesting dip in the middle that I'd like to talk about. Now this is when we applied the consistent licensing on GBIF data and any data sets that were not conforming to that license were removed at that point. Now leading up to there, we had um, people who were wishing to share their data and they were pushing it through GBIF, but in some cases there were statements like, you must contact me if you wish to use my data. Now, this was obviously a challenge for anybody who's trying to do research using the data with so many data sets. So what we did is we held a global consultation and we settled on three licenses from Creative Commons. And we said, from this moment on, we will apply these licenses and only data with carrying these licenses are suitable for sharing in GBIF. At the moment this happened, a few data sets were removed because they didn't conform to the licenses. Some of those were by mistake because people didn't realize that the deadline had, had come up and they came back quite quickly. But we did lose a couple of data sets along the way, but we recovered quite quickly. But after this point, we now find ourselves in a very nice position where it's very clear for everybody. It's clear for publishers what they're doing and how they're sharing their data and how it's going to be used. It's also clear for the researchers for what they can do with the data that they're accessing. One of the other things we pay close attention to is citation practice. And we have built our citation systems on digital object identifiers, DOIs. These are the same identifiers used by many papers in the publishing community, and it's very familiar to people. 
So every data set that is registered in GBIF is issued a DOI if it does not already have one. Whenever we deliver data from our systems, if someone makes a download, we ask that they cite the data using the DOI. So when you download data from GBIF, we give you a unique citation for that data download. We ask you to use the DOI in your papers. So on the screen, we can see iNaturalist, and we can see that it's had 1,282 citations um, in papers. So we also build an index of the citations themselves. So shown here are the 1,282 papers that have made use of data from iNaturalist that we have mediated through GBIF. So we build this index by crawling publisher metadata, the journal metadata, and we categorize it in a series of topics, um, and we make this available to our publishing community. Now, this is very useful for many institutions. It allows them to demonstrate that by sharing their data through GBIF, it has enabled all of this research. And this is the research we're seeing at around about four publications per day now, citing GBIF use. And what this does is it helps demonstrate to people why they are sharing data. It helps complete the picture and bring comfort into why participate in this network. We do this to enable open science and to further science, and we're able to actually quantify that by indexing these papers. One of the things that we've been exploring is how we can take our accepted DOI-based citation practice and apply it to machine learning models and AI models that are built using the content that we deliver. And we worked as a pilot example with a previous winner of the FGVC competition who had built a model using images that had been mediated through the GBIF community. So we delivered a data set of images um, with a DOI, and they used that to train their model, and they put their model into TensorFlow Hub. We got a DOI for the output model that they built. Now that DOI was linked to the DOI for the data download that we provided, itself linking to each of the data sets that published images to GBIF. We're now in the position that if anyone uses that model, um, in an application or in some research, they will cite the model using a DOI. That allows us to follow the citation trail all the way back to the original data publishers for the images used to build the model and say, hey, your images played some part in building that model in the application. That's a small piece of information that helps reinforce the importance of the original data set that was shared through GBIF. We believe that this is a good approach to consider going forward, and we're, we're keen to talk to others in the community if this would be a manageable way to help showcase the importance of training data for model building. So I'd like to say thank you again for having me today. Um, I hope that some of the things that I've presented may have some interest to you. I hope to see some of your projects uh, within GBIF in the future, or perhaps we can help you with some of our services for organizing data. And I invite any of you to, to contact me directly or approach the GBIF help desk on the email addresses shown. Thank you very much.